contract information. Um, and our point of view is that this requires involvement and inputs um, from across the organization and across the processes that you have, not just your sort of quote unquote legal staff. Um, so we're going to be talking about that through, um, through some examples and through some sort of um, practical and, and um, sort of policy approaches as well. So if you can next slide, please. So just quickly who we are and why we're talking about this. So um, my colleagues, uh, Annie and Ariadna and myself are from the Europeana Network Association Copyright Community. So we're a group of um, professionals who are interested in, in copyright and digital cultural heritage. Um, it's a wide and large community, so if you're not aware of us or you'd like to join us or hear more about us, please just look us up and feel free to join and have a, have a look at what the events and activities that we put on. Um, our work plan, we have a work plan for each year as part of the community steering group and part of our plan for this year is promoting the use of standardised rights information uh, across European institutions. So particularly supporting the, what's called the European Accuracy Strategy, which again is going back to this point about having really accurate rights information. So that's something that we'll highlight, um, particularly through the examples at the end of our talk today and why that's so important. But yeah, really stressing to try, uh, the, the importance of standardised rights information is key for this for this year for us. And so this, this work that we're talking about right here is, is really integral to that. And then just briefly, as I said, yes, um, my, my colleagues today are from the, the steering group, uh, myself, um, I'm from the National Library of Scotland, my colleague Annie is going to speak to you next, um, from the British Film Institute, and uh, my colleague Ariadna from the European Foundation itself. So with that, I'll hand over to the next slide and Annie. Hi, thank you, Fred. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. So I'm going to go straight into exactly what we mean by rights information. Um, so, and I'm sorry, this is like text heavy and I won't read out the whole thing, but um, suffice to say that what we're talking about is um, some sort of key headers for types of information, which is uh, ultimately the copyright status of a work is one of the key things that everyone would need to know about whether your work is in copyright, out of copyright, or you do not know. Um, and the, to work this out, there are various bits of information one needs to try and capture and keep hold of around particular death dates of authors. You think given that copyright is generally calculated by uh, 70 years after the death of an, of an author. Um, also knowing <clears throat> about publication and release uh, as that can also determine copyright status and, and the countries of origin. Um, that's sort of one layer of copyright information, rights information, um, followed by ownership. So who is the person or organisation that can actually control those rights? Um, and it might be a single person organization might be your own institution or, or an unknown um, and getting to know that is quite often taking information from documents um, such as donor and rights holder agreements that you might have um, but also requires that kind of research into organizational and personal histories about how long people have lived for who they uh, who their heirs were or how organizations may have been um, bankrupt uh, become defunct and then who would have taken over their assets uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so sort of continuing on from that, you then have um, probably the more uh, sort of outward looking uh, rights information, uh, which is how you can label um, the kinds of uses you can you can make use of, of the works and collection. So this is about access, use and reuse um, and how you might label things to show that they are available for educational uses or commercial or non-commercial um, and there might be other restrictions in play as well. Um, alongside any kind of uh, structured data you might have about collecting for rights information and um, use and access information, um, organizations should also have policies for use and reuse to sort of sit alongside any kind of um, data processes you have. Um, Given that copyright is a is a quite a grey area in lots of ways um, and quite complex, so having guidance um, for everyone to understand what all these terms mean is very useful. Um, alongside that, obviously, in terms of information, we're talking about interoperable human and machine readable information. Um, so, write statements from Creative Commons. I'm not going to talk any more about that right now because I know we've got slides coming later, uh, which go into a bit more about that. But they're just two examples. Um, of um, rights information that can be shared out there. Next slide, please. So why is it important? Um, this is a slightly, should be longer this slide really, because it is important, but 
Um, I keep sort of repeating this thing of knowing what you and your users can and cannot do with every object. That's what rights information ultimately is, is all about. Um, and how um, your collection knowledge, or knowledge of your collections, uh, really needs to bring together the metadata that you have um, on technical descriptive metadata plus rights metadata. Um, because having the rights metadata as part of this bigger sort of ecosystem then enables your organization to have greater um, access, visibility, and, and reuse of your collections. Next slide, please. Benefits, again, knowing what you and your users can do, that's, that's a, a huge benefit. Um, adopting uh, data standards for rights um, then brings transparency, trust, and clarity for any user to understand what they can and cannot do. Uh, but I also think building in processes to capture rights information in your collections helps with the sort of longer term planning around your collection. So if you know a collection is going to be coming out of copyright in a few years, then that may well make a change, a change on how you're planning to do things with that collection that you might just wait a bit until it is out of copyright and easier to, to then share. Um, agility as well. Um, a lot of the time you're going back and looking at information again and then again and again to try and find out who might own rights or hold rights. Um, so if you have structured uh, rights data in your systems, then it makes it a lot easier to be able to find that information and react to organizational priorities or business needs um, and requests that come in. Um, so just as a sort of general thing of calling out, it'd be just understanding how organizations approach rights management and metadata. Um, and I think we'd be really interested to, to hear about people's examples. Next slide. Challenges. So there are a lot of challenges. <laughs> um, <laughs> So there are you know, the data challenges. You see, there are lots of different, um, uh, the resource and expertise needed to create the data in the first place, translating copyright rules into the structured data. So what kind of fields do you need to capture um, that are then going to help you determine copyright status and ownership of a work? Um, so I mentioned a few of those at the top about, you know, lots of death dates that you need to know. How do you codify contracts and agreements? Again, into structured data, that can be quite complex. And of course, for audiovisual works, generally they are notoriously complex just because they have many layers of different rights within the whole work, which itself has rights. Um, and I think also there are organizational challenges around advocating for um, greater investment and resource to develop rights information generally, um, and how you can bring together colleagues, particularly from rights and data, which is kind of what we're doing today. Uh, next slide, I think. That's it for me, over to you, Fred. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Annie. So I think that, um, yeah, hopefully that's, that's, that's helpful in terms of why the challenges and opportunities and the benefits and so on. And so before we go on to talk about a few different examples, um, my own organizations that kind of highlight things like you were saying, you know, right statements and creative commons license sort of approaches, um, we kind of wanted to highlight some work we've done as a corporate community that hopefully can help you uh, on this on this work and, and how to achieve and start to achieve this sort of work in your organizations. Um, so we've developed what we call the copyright management guidelines um, within the copyright community this year. So we published these um, as a first iteration this year. And uh, if we just go to the next slide, um, this is a brief introduction to what the guidelines uh, are about. It's a, it's a fairly short document um, following a, a hopefully nice and easily accessible um, structured to sort of plan to follow and the idea of, of these guidelines is to work towards what we've called the ultimate goal there and working through from the green at the bottom phases um, which will then ultimately get you to this goal which we say is to harmonize the approaches to copyright across your organization so this isn't sort of limited to to, to copyright statement accuracy that we're talking about today um, this is, you know, thinking about the full range of copyright matters that, that might affect your, your organization and its organizational work, from, from shops to metadata to, to, to corporate documentation and whatever else it might be. But, but understanding that all of that comes together and that you need a harmonized approach to those. And so we've set out in this document a sort of uh, starter guide to getting this done, whether you're the sort of quote unquote copyright person in your organization or not. Um, so if we can just go to the next slide, we can see a bit of how that. Um, guide is, is, is laid out and um, in particular some of the fields that are really hopefully quite helpful when we talk about copyright uh, right statement accuracy and getting accurate rights information so 
um, through phase one of the, of the guide, I'm not going to go through all the phases, but just as an example, phase one of the guide is about building your organization's foundation. So starting right at the uh, acquisition of, of content, for example, the first line there, you know, when you acquire content, as far as possible, obtaining copyright information at that point. Uh, you know, in many ways, that's going to be the most accurate information you've got at that point. It's the only information. So obtaining whatever you can. And what we've done is under each of these objectives, so acquisitions and, and documenting um, your collections and so on, we've kind of set out to describe the, the sort of steps and the people and the documents that you might want to get involved, how to start the conversation. So that if you are not the, the copyright person, or if you are the copyright person in your organization, you, you need uh, the support and buy-in of your peers and your colleagues and your managers. Uh, hopefully this is a sort of way into that. So just as a highlight, what we've talked about here is, you know, who to involve at the acquisition stage, uh, and who to involve at the, the stage when you're documenting um, use of your collections and your materials. So again, this goes to the point that this isn't just about the sort of quote unquote legal team. Um, there's a lot of people across organizations uh, and across sectors that they can have a really big input into accurate rights information. So if you just go to the next slide, oh, right, no. um, just highlighting again the same, the same point that what you want to document at each of these stages is really quite important. You know, ownership of all forms of copyright and the collection of material, as far as known, uh, and as well as gaps, for example, and that can be done by anyone um, who's really involved in that acquisition process, whatever your organizational setup is. And I guess the key thing to highlight there is that whilst we talk about roles like curators, legal advisors, um, documenting teams, licensing teams, and so on, I know that many, many organizations will not have those teams and those forums and will have probably many, many fewer staff working who will wear lots of different hats, for example. And that's absolutely fine. This is just really trying to highlight the different sort of range of, of the types of inputs, I guess, you'd want into these processes. Um, so the, the different kind of hats, obviously, you'd want to be wearing and thinking about, you know, um, the, the steps towards achieving a, a kind of record of accurate copyright information. So that, that's really kind of a bit of the abstract, and that's a guide that, that hopefully will be helpful to you. You can look it up on the Opiana uh, Copyright Community website, just Google for it, um, the, the Copyright Management Guidelines. But hopefully now we're going to move on to the um, a few examples and kind of show you how this actually works in, in practice, really. Great. So I'll, I'll take it over from here, and we'll start with the first example on how we manage uh, rights information on Europeana. But I have to say we're in the most comfortable position where we receive from the data providers, so all the institutions that do all the rights research, management, etc. The information already wrapped up in, in gift paper uh, in, in the form of a standardized piece of information that is very clear and straightforward for everyone to understand. So the moment a user comes into your piano, they would see an item page like the one you see on the screen with the digital object at the top, the metadata below, and just in between they have a standard uh, piece of rights information, like uh, rights uh, statements or creative commons, public domain tools or, or licenses, as Annie was saying earlier, that if the user clicks on it, they it would take the user to the, the complete rights information of, of, the, of the standard that they see on the screen. Um, for us, in, in the context of, of Europeana, using standardized rights information is extremely, extremely important. I, um, like I cannot stress enough how important that is. It does simplify very complex rights information. So it's our safest bet if our goal is to facilitate and encourage the reuse of the um, data available on Europeana. So it does provide a lot of clarity for the user. And specifically, it's important for everyone, uh, any type of institution, but when you think of the context in which Europeana operates, which is online, multilingual, and cross-national, and therefore also cross-jurisdictional, we really need a type of standard that can operate across all of these uh, challenges. Challenges, let's say, excuse me. Um, and also, as Annie pointed out, they are both human and machine readable, which is also essential for an online context. When data providers, so cultural heritage institutions, submit data to Europeana, they would provide the rights information through mostly two metadata fields, one that is mandatory and that will fit into that, um, that little box that you saw just below the, the digital object, and one that is non-mandatory through which data providers can provide additional precision or information that they believe should be, uh, the, the user should be aware of. Um, and what uh, so the, the standard just below the digital object, so the one that is uh, uh, mandatory to provide when submitting data to Europeana, should be one of the 14 options that you see highlighted in gray. 
So we support the use of any of the six Creative Commons licenses, any of the two Creative Commons public domain tools, and six out of the 12 right statements by the right statements consortium. Uh, generally with the idea, although this probably needs to be re uh, reviewed, but with the idea that this range of statements would provide sufficient um, uh, possibility, like they would cover all of the possibilities that a cultural heritage institution might assess um, is uh, the, the digital object is subject to. So uh, we would generally encourage using as much as possible Creative Commons licenses or tools because they are the ones that effectively facilitate reuse the most. But when that is not possible, which is often the case for audiovisual material because um, the rights holder is unknown or the rights are too complex to clear and the organization, organization doesn't have sufficient permission, rights statements can also be very handy. So I'll hand it over to Fred now. So yeah, I, I'll give a very quick example. And unfortunately, it's not an audiovisual uh, example, but I liked it because it was uh, involved um, European and it's a very recent item. And I'd actually just noticed um, an issue with it. I just realized I can't actually see the bottom of the image. So the point I was going to make isn't uh, there. That might have been my fault in making the slides. Uh, hmm. Any way to make the image slightly smaller? Do you think if I uh... ah there we go now I can see it. Oh. Ah, okay. Yeah, if you just make it yeah. Um, sorry, not great, but I'll, I'll just move the image up and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. That's perfect. Thanks. Yeah, so you'll just ignore the boxes, but uh, <laughs> the yes. So this was a um, not, as I say, not an audiovisual item, but I kind of wanted to highlight um. The, these differences between accurate metadata rights information and, and, and where we as organizations have to think about all these other things. Um, so this is a, a digitized item from, from the National Library of Scotland collections that we published this year. And um, where there was a box on the right there, the sort of big uh, square box, um, you can see where we've put that that is our rights metadata information being displayed. So that's in the actual metadata records and that's displayed through this, this viewer here. Um, and it's saying there's no known copyrights. So that is taking one of the right statements from rightstatements.org. It's actually one of the ones that isn't accepted by Europeana, but it is um, one of the standardized rights information, right statements nonetheless. So it is a standard, it is a agreed standard. Um, and it's explaining that there's no known copyright in that work. And for more information, visit our copyright page. And you can see that, that information you know, repeated in the attribution box below, and then their attribution pop up to the left. So there's sort of three points where it's telling you the same piece of information, but that's all just generated from our metadata. And that's quite a new approach for us to have these actual right statements um, in there. And you can see the legacy issues that we have because underneath um, where it says universal viewer, there's then a it's zoomable image on this page may be used with the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. And that isn't true because we've just said the item is that there's probably not some copyright, it's not our copyrights, so we shouldn't be licensing it. And this is a hangover from when we took a different approach to copyright and we, we wrote this statement on our website. So rather than putting it into our metadata, we had inaccurate rights information on our website as part of our web page. Um, and it only just, I only just realized uh, the other week that this was the case on this particular item, for example, that we were still displaying that old information uh, along with the new information because the new information was being derived from the metadata and the old statement wasn't coming from a metadata perspective. So this goes back to that original point about working together as an organization and having this harmonized approach. And we've done one thing really advanced on the metadata side, and then we have forgotten about the, the sort of web view and what that would impact on rights information. So it's kind of just to demonstrate that, you know, and we're standing here talking about this new eve, at least from my own perspective, how, how tidying up to do. So with that, I'll pass over to Annie. Thanks, Fred. Uh, yeah, so uh, very quickly, this is another example. This is an audiovisual work. Um, uh, and uh, really what I'm trying to demonstrate here is this is actually work that is in the BFI um, National Archive. And I haven't actually got my red boxes, but if you see down at the lower left, it will say copyright notice, crown copyright managed by the BFI. Um, this actually is from the Welcome Collection uh, website. And uh, because B BFI doesn't uh, capture rights information um, formally as part of uh, archive collections generally. Uh, so this is just an example of this thing of uh, the benefits of rights information of enabling people to know what they can and cannot do with things is 
I had to research this title for a project, I actually found this information on the Wellcome website, not BFI, um, that then confirmed to me what I thought was true, that it was a crime copyright title and therefore it was managed by us. Um, but uh, and, and but Wellcome obviously uh, do have um, these processes in place to capture rights information and then publish under Creative Commons. Um, and a crown copyright is a bit of a weird one in terms of, of the UK, so not everyone has that, but I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, but this is just, just one example of a, of a kind of um, the benefits of, of publishing works with associated rights um, metadata uh, just makes everyone's life a lot easier. Um, so thank you very much. I think then there's that the end. That's the end. Wonderful. That is the end. Thank you.